Hey everybody, uh, before I get started, I just want to explain really quickly how this video is going to work. Um, this is for the short story Soldier's Home by Ernest Hemingway. And I'm going to start with just a little introduction to explain Ernest Hemingway's writing style. And then after that, um, I will read the entire story aloud from start to finish with maybe a few of my own comments. And then, But then after I finish reading the story, I'll have a little bit more analysis and kind of what I think are some important things to take away from it. So if you would rather read the story for yourself and not listen to me read it, uh, go ahead and do that. I'll post a link to where you can find the story on Classroom. And I will also put a timestamp in the description for this video if you want to just skip me reading it and go straight to my analysis at the end. All right, here we go. Ernest Hemingway once said, I always try to write on the principle of the iceberg. There is seven eighths of it underwater for every part that shows. And I think this is really important for understanding uh, what is special about his writing. I think at first glance, Ernest Hemingway's stories can seem very simple and they're very easy to read, um, which I think makes them very popular with a lot of people. But I think it's important that you don't assume that simplicity of writing equals simplicity of thought. Um, as he's explaining with this metaphor of the iceberg, maybe the, the, you know, the, the simple writing that you see on the surface is only part of the story. That if you look beneath the surface, that you will see there's actually a great complexity of thought behind these simple words and simple sentences that he's using. Um, I have another analogy for you that, I, that I'm pretty fond of because I always like to try to explain literature in terms of visual art. And um, in, in visual art, there's something that artists call negative space. You know, it's the part of the canvas or the paper that does not have any ink or paint applied to it. And, you know, I have it here for you a couple of logos that I found on, there's a whole website devoted to finding clever logos that make use of negative space. Here you see the plunger that the guy is holding is defined in negative space. Um, um, you know, that that's a little bit, uh, yeah, kind of a, just a, a, a clever use of it. I also like, you know, more subtle uses of negative space, like in this logo for the World Wildlife Foundation of the panda, you know. Um, anybody who looks at this can clearly tell it's a panda, but if you look really closely, you see that, you know, the, the parts that are black, the parts that are, you know, drawn, um, really only make up, like, small sections of the panda. And they're entire sections of the panda. I mean, most of his head, for example, that is defined in negative space. And the thing about the way that your eye works is you look at this and you don't necessarily see that as emptiness. Your brain fills that with what ought to be there. And I think that's the brilliance of negative space. Uh, one more quick example of art that I like. Uh, this is a sculpture that is meant to be like a negative space version of a billboard. I think I think the concept here is that this is a billboard advertising the idea of clean air, where the billboard itself is completely empty and you have kind of this weird um, network of wires that help to define this empty rectangle that is the billboard itself. So I like the idea of negative space in art and I also like the idea that negative space can exist in literature as well. That sometimes a writer can say something by not saying that thing. Or maybe that there, there's sometimes that there is a hole in the story where something ought to be. And I think a really clever writer can write it in a way that the reader notices that there's something absent and the absence of that thing is significant. I'll have more to say about that uh, at, the, at the end of the video, but right now I'm gonna get to actually reading the story. Um, so this is Soldier's Home by Ernest Hemingway. Krebs went to the war from a Methodist college in Kansas. 
There is a picture which shows him among his fraternity brothers, all of them wearing exactly the same height and style collar. He enlisted in the Marines in 1917 and did not return to the United States until the 2nd Division returned from the Rhine in the summer of 1919. There is a picture which shows him on the Rhine, uh, should be on the Rhine, with two German girls and another corporal. Krebs and the corporal look too big for their uniforms. The German girls are not beautiful. The Rhine does not show in the picture. By the time Krebs returned to his hometown in Oklahoma, the greeting of heroes was over. He came back much too late. The men from the town who had been drafted had all been welcomed elaborately on their return. There had been a great deal of hysteria. Now the reaction had set in. People seemed to think it was rather ridiculous for Krebs to be getting back so late, years after the war was over. At first, Krebs, who had been at Belleau Wood, Soissons, the Champagne, St. Mihiel, and in the Argonne, did not want to talk about the war at all. Later, he felt the need to talk, but no one wanted to hear about it. His town had heard too many atrocity stories to be thrilled by actualities. Krebs found that to be listened to at all, he had to lie, and after he had done this twice, he too had a reaction against the war and against talking about it. A distaste for everything that had happened to him in the war set in because of the lies he had told. All of the times that had been able to make him feel cool and clear inside himself when he thought of them, the times so long back when he had done the one thing, the only thing for a man to do, easily and naturally, when he might have done something else, now lost their cool, valuable quality and then were lost themselves. His lies were quite unimportant lies, and consisted in attributing to himself things other men had seen, done, or heard of, and stating as fact certain apocryphal incidents familiar to all soldiers. Even his lies were not sensational at the pool room. His acquaintances, who had heard detailed accounts of German women found chained to machine guns in the Argonne and who could not comprehend or were barred by their patriotism from interest in any German machine gunners who were not chained, were not thrilled by his stories. Krebs acquired the nausea in regard to experience that is the result of untruth or exaggeration, and when he occasionally met another man who had really been a soldier, and he talked a few and they talked a few minutes in the dressing room at a dance hall, he fell into the easy pose of the old soldier among other soldiers, that he'd been badly, sickeningly frightened all the time. In this way he lost everything. During this time, it was late summer, he was sleeping late in bed, getting up to walk downtown to the library to get a book, eating lunch at home, reading on the front porch until he became bored, and then walking down through the town to spend the hottest hours of the day in the cool dark of the pool room. He loved to play pool. In the evening, he practiced on his clarinet, strolled downtown, read, and went to bed. He was still a hero to his two young sisters. His mother would have given him breakfast in bed if he had wanted it. She often came in when he was in bed and asked him to tell her about the war, but her attention always wandered. His father was noncommittal. Before Krebs went away to the war, he had never been allowed to drive the family motor car. His father was in the real estate business and always wanted the car to be at his command when he required it to take clients out into the country to show them a piece of farm property. The car always stood outside the first National Bank building, where his father had an office on the second floor. Now, after the war, it was still the same car. Nothing was changed in the town except that the young girls had grown up. But they lived in such a complicated world of already defined alliances and shifting feuds that Krebs did not feel the energy or the courage to break into it. He liked to look at them, though. There were so many good-looking young girls. Most of them had their hair cut short. When he went away, only little girls wore their hair like that, or girls that were fast. They all wore sweaters and shirt waists with round Dutch collars. It was a pattern. He liked to look at them from the front porch as they walked on the other side of the street. He liked to watch them walking under the shade of the trees. He liked the round Dutch collars above their sweaters. He liked their silk stockings and flat shoes. He liked their bobbed hair and the way they walked. When he was in town, their appeal to him was not very strong. He did not like them when he saw them in the Greek's ice cream parlor. He did not want them themselves, really. They were too complicated. 
There was something else. Vaguely, he wanted a girl, but he did not want to have to work to get her. He would have liked to have a girl, but he did not want to have to spend a long time getting her. He did not want to get into the intrigue and the politics. He did not want to have to do any courting. He did not want to tell any more lies. It wasn't worth it. He did not want any consequences. He did not want any consequences ever again. He wanted to live along without consequences. Because he did not really need a girl. The army had taught him that. It was all right to pose as though you had to have a girl. Nearly everybody did that, but it wasn't true. You did not need a girl. That was the funny thing. First, a fellow boasted how girls mean nothing to him, that he never thought of them, that they could not touch him. Then a fellow boasted that he could not get along without girls, that he had to have them all the time, that he could not go to sleep without them. That was all a lie. It was all a lie both ways. You do not need a girl unless you thought about them. He learned that in the army. Then sooner or later, you always got one. When you're really ripe for a girl, you always got one. You do not have to think about it. Sooner or later, it would come. He had learned that in the army. Now, he would have liked a girl if she had come to him and not wanted to talk. But here at home, it was all too complicated. He knew he could never get through it all again. It was not worth the trouble. That was the thing about French girls and German girls. There was not all this talking. You couldn't talk much, and you did not need to talk. It was simple, and you were friends. He thought about France, and then he began to think about Germany. On the whole, he had liked Germany better. He did not want to leave Germany. He did not want to come home. Still, he had come home. He sat on the front porch. He liked the girls that were walking along the other side of the street. He liked the look of them much better than the French girls or the German girls. But the world they were in was not the world he was in. He would like to have one of them, but it was not worth it. There was such a nice pattern. He liked the pattern. It was exciting, but he would not go through all the talking. He did not want one badly enough. He liked to look at them all, though. It was not worth it. Not now when things were getting good again. He sat there on the porch, reading a book on the war. It was a history, and he was reading about all the engagements he had been in. It was the most interesting reading he had ever done. He wished there were more maps. He looked forward to the good feeling to reading all the really good histories when they would come out with good detail maps. Now he was really learning about the war. He had been a good soldier. That made a difference. One morning, after he had been home about a month, his mother came into his bedroom and sat on the bed. She smoothed her apron. I had a talk with your father last night, Harold, she said, and he is willing for you to take the car out in the evenings. Yeah, said Krebs, who was not fully awake, take the car out. Yeah? Yes. Your father has felt for some time that you should be able to take the car out in the evenings whenever you wished, but we only talked it over last night. I'll bet you made him, Krebs said. No, it was your father's suggestion that we talked the matter over. Yeah, I'll bet you made him, Krebs said up in bed. Will you come down to breakfast, Harold, his mother said. As soon as I get my clothes on, Krebs said. His mother went out of the room and he could hear her frying something downstairs while he washed, shaved, and dressed to go down into the dining room for breakfast. While he was eating breakfast, his sister brought in the mail. "'Well, Hare,' she said, "'you old sleepy head, what do you ever get up for?' Krebs looked at her. He liked her. She was his best sister. "'Have you got the paper?' he asked. She handed him the Kansas City Star, and he shucked off its brown wrapper and opened it to the sporting page. He folded the star open and propped it against the water pitcher with his cereal dish to steady it so he could read while he ate. Harold, his mother stood in the kitchen doorway. Harold, please don't muss up the paper. Your father can't read his star if it's been mussed. I won't muss it, Krebs said. His sister sat down at the table and watched him while he read. We're playing indoor over at school this morning, she said. I'm going to pitch. Good, said Krebs. How's the old wing? I can pitch better than lots of the boys. I tell them all you taught me. The other girls aren't much good. Yeah, said Krebs. I tell them all you're my beau. Aren't you my beau, Hare? You bet. Couldn't your brother really be your beau just because he's your brother? I don't know. Sure you know. Couldn't you be my beau, Hare, if I was old enough and you wanted to? Sure. You're my girl now. Am I really your girl? Sure. Do you love me? Uh-huh. Do you love me always? Sure. Will you come over and watch me play indoor? Maybe. 
Ah, Hare, you don't love me. If you loved me, you'd want to come over and watch me play indoor. Treb's mother came into the dining room from the kitchen. She carried a plate with two fried eggs and some crisp bacon on it and a plate of buckwheat cakes. You run along, Helen, she said. I want to talk to Harold. She put the eggs and bacon down in front of him and brought in a jug of maple syrup for the buckwheat cakes. Then she sat down across the table from Krebs. I wish you'd put down the paper a minute, Harold, she said. Krebs took down the paper and folded it. Have you decided what you're going to do yet, Harold? His mother said, taking off her glasses. No, said Krebs. Don't you think it's about time? His mother did not say this in a mean way. She seemed worried. I hadn't thought about it, Krebs said. God has some work for everyone to do, his mother said. There can be no idle hands in his kingdom. I'm not in his kingdom, Krebs said. We are all of us in his kingdom. Krebs felt embarrassed and resentful, as always. I've worried about you too much, Harold, his mother went on. I know the temptations you must have been exposed to. I know how weak men are. I know what your own dear grandfather, my own father, told us about the Civil War, and I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you all day long, Harold. Krebs looked at the bacon fat hardening on his plate. Your father is worried, too, his mother went on. He thinks you have lost your ambition, that you haven't got a definite aim in life. Charlie Simmons, who is just your age, has a good job and is going to be married. The boys are all settling down. They're all determined to get somewhere. You can see that boys like Charlie Simmons are on their way to being really a credit to the community. Krebs said nothing. Don't look that way, Harold, his mother said. You know we love you, and I want to tell you for your own good how matters stand. Your father does not want to hamper your freedom. He thinks you should be allowed to drive the car. If you want to take some of the nice girls out riding with you, we're only too pleased. We want you to enjoy yourself. But you're going to have to settle down to work, Harold. Your father doesn't care what you start in at all. Work is honorable, as he says. We've got to make a start at something. He asked me to speak to you this morning, and then you can stop in and see him at his office. Is that all? Krebs said. Yes. Don't you love your mother, dear boy? No, Krebs said. His mother looked at him across the table. Her eyes were shiny. She started crying. I don't love anybody, Krebs said. It wasn't any good. He couldn't tell her. He couldn't make her see it. It was silly to have said it. He'd only hurt her. He went over and took hold of her arm. She was crying with her head in her hands. I didn't mean it, he said. I was just angry at something. I didn't mean I didn't love you. His mother went on crying. Krebs put his arm on her shoulder. Can't you believe me, mother? His mother shook her head. Please, please, mother, please believe me. All right, his mother said chokily. She looked up at him. I believe you, Harold. Krebs kissed her hair. She put her face up to him. I'm your mother, she said. I held you next to my heart when you were a tiny baby. Krebs felt sick and vaguely nauseated. I know, mummy, he said. I'll try and be a good boy for you. Would you kneel and pray with me, Harold? His mother asked. They knelt down beside the dining room table, and Krebs' mother prayed. Now you pray, Harold, she said. I can't, Krebs said. Try, Harold. I can't. Do you want me to pray for you? Yes. So his mother prayed for him, and then they stood up, and Krebs kissed his mother and went out of the house. He had tried so to keep his life from being complicated. Still, none of it had touched him. He had felt sorry for his mother, and she had made him lie. He would go to Kansas City and get a job, and she, she would feel all right about it. There would be one more scene, maybe, before he got away. He would not go down to his father's office. He would miss that one. He wanted his life to go smoothly. It had just gotten going that way. Well, that was all over now, anyway. He would go over to the schoolyard and watch Helen play indoor baseball. All right, so that's the end of the story. Um, so first of all, uh, in case you didn't pick up on it, uh, this story is, is pretty clearly a, a depiction of somebody who has post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and if you know uh, something about this in history you know world war one was when i think people started to be more aware of ptsd you know at the time the term they used was shell shock but it's the same thing and 
yeah, the, and then soldiers who came back from the war were having, you know, these emotional, psychological, mental health problems, and 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 people were just aware of of that idea of PTSD in a way that they hadn't really before, or at least people were talking about the way they hadn't before. And so that's what Ernest Hemingway is depicting here. This guy Krebs clearly is suffering from a PTSD. You know, throughout the story, there are references to how he, he doesn't want things to be complicated. He feels like life back home in the States is complicated. It was simpler being a soldier. You know, he thinks of himself as a good soldier. He felt like he was doing the right thing. He knew what to do. He knew what was expected of him. That was simple. And and we know that, you know, I mean, this is um, a pretty common among a lot of people who have PTSD. When they, they fight overseas in a foreign war, and then um, a lot of people have some difficulty adjusting to civilian life back in back in the States. So that's one thing that we're seeing here. Um, to get back to this idea of the iceberg that I introduced at the start of this, um, I, guess I, I would point to a lot of the places where Krebs is saying nothing or saying almost nothing. Uh, you know, there, there's a passage here in, in page six of this document where, oh yeah, so when, when Krebs is talking to his sister, you know, every answer he gives is a one word answer. You know, just look at what it, look at his, what he says. He says, you bet. I don't know. Sure. You're my girl now. Sure. Uh-huh. Sure. Maybe. You know, given the most minimal answers possible, I think that's one way that, that Ernest Hemingway makes use of this idea of the iceberg principle. Through these very simple answers, we as the reader are left to fill in the gaps, to imagine what is Krebs really feeling? What is he really thinking in these moments? Because in his verbal expressions, he's giving practically nothing. Um, another thing, I mean, this, this, and this is one of my favorite things about this story, uh, the character of Krebs's father. Now, he's talked about in the story, but I don't know if you noticed, the father never actually appears. And when he's, when he's first mentioned in the story, I think on the, in the first page here, it's describing his family. And it talks about his sister, Krebs' sisters, and it talks about his mother. And after some brief descriptions of his sisters and his mother, we get one sentence about his father. His father was non-committal. And even that is not really telling us anything. What does that mean that he's non-committal? This is giving us, yeah, it's, it's it, the sentence itself is very short, but even that short sentence contains virtually no information for us. The character of his father is just a hole, an, an, an empty void. That's where I really see the negative space in the story. And then later, when Krebs' mother is talking to him about taking the car, she tells him that his father is okay with it. You know, the mom says, I had to talk to your father last night. He is willing for you to take the car out in the evenings. And she said, again, she, yes, your father has felt for some time he should be able to take the car out in the evenings. And, and Krebs sees through this. He says, I'll bet you made him. She says, no, it's your father's suggestion that we talk the matter over. Yeah, but I think Krebs is right. I think the mother is lying. I think the father is meant to be completely absent from this story. It's the mom who wants him to take the car out. And she is saying these things, claiming that his father says this. And the mother, throughout the story, claims to speak for the father but we're not really hearing anything from the father himself. So taken as a whole, I think it's fascinating that the father is just completely absent from the story in every possible way. And I, and to, you know, in, in, if we're thinking that in terms of negative space, then our brains fill in that gap. And I think the conclusion that we come to then is that the father is not just absent from the story. The father is absent from Krebs' life. The Krebs and his father have a terrible relationship. Maybe they always had a terrible relationship. Maybe even before he left for the war, 
they didn't get along. If you ask me, it's because I think they're very similar, you know, because Krebs himself is very non-expressive, non-emotional, which is the impression that we get about the father as well from the lack of information and the lack of any kind of presence of the father in the story. All right. Uh, I think that is going to do it for this. Thanks for following along with me or listening to my analysis at the end. Hope you all have a great day.